Welcome to another deep dive. Today we're going to be talking about end of life care decisions. Oh, great. Um, and, you know, this is a, a topic that can be really sensitive. Yes. But also, I think, kind of shrouded in confusion. Yeah. So we're going to try to, like, unpack some of these terms. Okay. We're going to look at this article. It's called Explaining Withholding Treatment, Withdrawing Treatment, and Palliative Sedation. Okay. And it really tries to get into, like, what the differences are between these different approaches to end of life care. I see. And then... Uh, and how they can impact the quality of life for for folks who are, you know, nearing the end of life. Right. And uh, it, what I really like about this article is that it 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 uses all these real life case studies, mm -hmm. so we can really see like how these decisions play out. Interesting. In, in actual situations. Yeah. So let's start with kind of a big picture thing. You know, traditionally in healthcare, mm -hmm. um, the focus has been on extending life. Right. Sometimes, like, at all costs, right? Yes. Um, but now we're seeing a shift towards this idea of palliative care. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about how palliative care is different from that traditional approach? Well, I mean, palliative care really shifts the focus to quality of life as death is approaching. Mm -hmm. And it acknowledges that sometimes the kindest choice is to allow natural death to occur. Yeah. Rather than using aggressive treatment that only prolongs the dying process. Right. And it really respects the patient's autonomy in deciding whether or not to pursue treatments. Yeah. That might, you know, only prolong that dying process. It makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, shifting from quantity to quality, yeah. right? Like yeah. really focusing on how a person is experiencing their final days. Exactly. Um, rather than just like, you know, squeezing out every possible you know, day or week or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a lot of confusion around the terms withholding treatment and withdrawing treatment. Right. What's the difference between these two things? So withholding treatment is simply choosing not to start a particular treatment. Okay. So, for example, if someone with advanced cancer decides against chemotherapy, okay. that would be withholding treatment. Gotcha. And then withdrawing treatment, on the other hand, is stopping a treatment that has already begun. Okay. So, like, if someone on a ventilator decides they no longer want to be on life support, right? that's withdrawing treatment. Okay, so the main difference is just, like, whether it's already started or not. Right. But in both cases, it seems like the goal is to honor the patient's wishes. Yes. And, like, what they want for their end-of-life experience. Exactly, and it empowers them to make choices mm -hmm. that align with their values and preferences. Yeah. Whether that means allowing natural death uh -huh. or focusing on comfort and symptom management. Right. Yeah. And the article has some really interesting case studies that really highlight this. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is about a woman named Linda. Yes. Who was on dialysis for kidney failure. Mm -hmm. um, but she ultimately decided to stop treatment. Yes. Be hmm. Because it wasn't really improving her quality of life. Mm -hmm. So how does Linda's story illustrate the importance of patient autonomy? Well, it shows that... Linda made this conscious choice to forego dialysis, even though she knew yeah. that it would probably shorten her life. Yeah. But she chose to prioritize her comfort mm -hmm. and spending time with loved ones in her final days. That's really powerful. Yes. I mean, to have that kind of clarity. Right. And that sense of control. Yeah. I think that's really something. It is. Um, another case study is about Jorge. Yes. Who had leukemia. Mm -hmm. And he opted to stop both blood transfusions and antibiotics. Mm -hmm. It was a tough decision, obviously. Yeah. But he was very clear that he didn't want to prolong his suffering right. with treatments that weren't really working. Yeah. So how do these stories, you know, Linda's and Jorge's, mm -hmm. demonstrate that withholding or withdrawing, treatment isn't about giving up? Well, they both show that, you know, it's about making informed choices yeah. that are, you know, consistent with their values and preferences yeah. and how they want to live out their remaining time. Right. And their decisions were made, you know, in consultation with their families mm. and their medical team, right. ensuring that everybody understood what they wanted yeah. and the implications. That's really important that it's not just like a unilateral decision, right? Right. It's like a, a collaborative process. Yeah. Um, and these stories are really powerful because they show that even when people are facing serious illness, mm -hmm. they still have agency. Yes. And the right to make decisions about their own bodies. Right. And their own lives. Exactly. And it shows that healthcare providers should be guiding yeah. and supporting them in these decisions, uh -huh. but not dictating them. Right. Yeah. Well, speaking of difficult decisions, yeah. the article also talks about... Um, 
you know, food and fluids at the end of life, which I know can be a really, really tough one yes, for families to grapple with. It is. So what are some of the things that we should keep in mind mm -hmm. when we're thinking about this, this aspect of end of life care? Well, it's a natural instinct to want to nourish our loved ones, mm -hmm. especially when they're, you know, nearing the end of life. Yeah. But it's important to understand that, you know, as illness progresses, the body's needs and responses change. What do you mean by that? Well, the body might not be able to process food and fluids I... as effectively. Okay. And things like artificial nutrition and hydration, yeah. which would be like feeding tubes or IV fluids, right. might seem comforting, but in some cases they can actually cause more discomfort really? than relief. Wow. Yeah. So it's not just about like, you know, giving someone food or water right. to keep them alive. Right. It's also about whether their body can even use it Yeah. at that point. Exactly. That's a really important distinction. It is. So the article makes it clear that withholding or withdrawing artificial nutrition and hydration right. isn't meant to speed up death. Right. It's about recognizing that sometimes the most compassionate thing mm -hmm. is to let that natural dying process. Yeah. Yeah. unfold yeah. and focus on comfort measures exactly. like mouth care right or managing any pain yeah okay so again it's about that that shift in focus mm -hmm. from quantity to quality yes and, and making sure that you know the person is as comfortable as possible exactly um I, I think these are decisions that are probably never easy no and the article talks about you know the emotional weight of these choices yes so how can families and healthcare providers kind of work together mm -hmm. to have those tough conversations. I think it's all about open and honest discussions with loved ones yeah. and the healthcare team mm -hmm. so that, you know, everybody understands the patient's wishes right, and the potential outcomes yeah. of their decisions. And having those conversations, you know, early on, yeah. I think is really important. Absolutely. So you're not like scrambling yeah. to figure things out right. at the last minute. Exactly. Um, okay. So We've talked about withholding treatment, withdrawing treatment, mm -hmm. and decisions about food and fluids. Right. Now let's get into another topic that I know can be kind of confusing and even scary for yeah. folks. Mm -hmm. Palliative sedation. Okay. So what exactly is palliative sedation and when is it used? Well, palliative sedation is using medication to reduce awareness uh -huh. and relieve those severe symptoms at the end of life. Okay. It's important to remember that it's not intended to hasten death, Okay. but it's used to provide comfort when other measures just aren't working. Okay, so it's like a last resort. Exactly. When someone is really suffering mm -hmm. and, and nothing else is helping. Yeah. And the article has some, some case studies about this as well. Yes. Um, one of them is about a man named Jim who developed delirium. Right. Because he was he had severe liver failure. Yeah. And he was really agitated and confused mm -hmm. and in a lot of distress. Mm -hmm. um, so how did palliative sedation help in his case? Well, it provided relief from his unbearable suffering yeah. and allowed him to die peacefully. Okay. It's important to note that palliative sedation is always carefully considered. Yeah. And it's done, you know, in consultation with the patient, if possible, mm -hmm. and their family. Right. And the whole healthcare team. Right. Yeah. So it's not a decision that's made lightly. No. And it sounds like it can be really helpful for people who are in a lot of pain. Yes. Or, or distress. It can. Um, well, these stories and these explanations, I think, are just so valuable mm -hmm. for anyone who's facing these kinds of decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether for themselves or for a loved one. Right. Um, and it gives you the feeling like, you know, there are options. Yes. Right. There are things that you can do to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, end of life is as comfortable and dignified as possible. Right. And I think it's really important to remember mm -hmm. that you don't have to go through this alone. Exactly. Right. Yeah. There are resources out there. Yeah. There are people who can help. Right. So if you're struggling with these issues, mm -hmm. please reach out. Absolutely. Um, well, that's it for this part of our deep dive on end of life care decisions. Okay. <laughs> we'll be back soon with more insights and discussions. Great. Thanks for listening. Yeah. See you next time. <laughs> okay. You know, it's interesting how the article talks about the ethical side of things. Yeah. Like when it comes to withholding or withdrawing treatment. Right. There's this idea that sometimes people think withdrawing treatment is like 
morally different. Yeah, I've heard that. From withholding it. Like it's somehow worse yeah. to stop something. Yeah. That's already started. Exactly. Yeah. But the article makes a good point. It says, ethically speaking, okay. both decisions are based on the same principles. Oh, interesting. Like respecting the patient's autonomy, right. minimizing their suffering, mm -hmm. and recognizing that not all medical interventions are beneficial right. or even desired. Right. It's about what's best for the patient. Exactly. Not about like some abstract rule. Yeah. And they use this analogy in the article. Oh, yeah. That I thought was really helpful. Okay. They compare medical interventions to other kinds of care. Okay. Like giving someone food and water. Okay. And they say, you know, we wouldn't force someone to eat or drink. Right. If they couldn't swallow. Yeah. Or if they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. So why should we force them to undergo medical treatments? I see. That are no longer helpful. That's a good point. Or that they don't want. Right. So it's about shifting the focus away from specific interventions. Yeah. And onto those core principles mm -hmm. of respecting the patient's wishes and promoting their well-being. Exactly. And it highlights how important communication is. Yeah. And making these decisions together. Uh-huh. Ideally, these conversations should happen early on. Yeah, like before things get really critical. Exactly. So you know what the patient wants right. as their illness progresses. And that's where advanced care planning comes in. Right. Having those conversations, yeah. putting things in writing mm -hmm. so everyone knows what to do. Exactly. It gives everyone peace of mind. It really does. Yeah. Now, speaking of tough conversations, yeah, the article also gets into this really sensitive topic. Okay. About food and fluids. Right. At the end of life. That's a hard one. It is. And I think it's one of those things that just instinctively feels wrong. Yeah. To withhold food and water. Yeah. You want to nourish your loved one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But the article explains that, you know, in the context of advanced illness. Yeah. The body's needs change. Right. Like the body might not be able to process things. Yeah. The same way anymore. It's exactly. So giving artificial nutrition and hydration. Mm hmm might not actually be helpful. Right. Sometimes it can even prolong suffering wow. without any real benefit to the patient. So it's not as simple as it seems. No. Right. No. Like our gut reaction might not be the best guide. Right. In these situations. Exactly. We really have to rely on, you know, communication with the doctors, yeah. medical expertise, mm -hmm. compassionate understanding of the patient's condition. Absolutely. They have this case study in the article about a woman named Mabel. Mm -hmm. She had advanced dementia. Okay. And her daughter was really worried. Yeah. About her starving to death. Right. But the medical team explained that as dementia progresses, mm -hmm. the body naturally loses interest in food and fluids. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. that. Yeah. So it's not that she's being deprived. Right. It's that her body's not needing it. Exactly. And forcing artificial nutrition at that point. Yeah. Yeah can actually cause discomfort and complications. Oh, I see. So it's really about shifting the focus to comfort care, mm. right? Like good mouth care. Yeah. Rather than forcing something Yeah. that the body can't use. I see. So it's about allowing the natural process to happen, Yeah. but making sure the person is comfortable. Right. Yeah. It's a different way of thinking about it. It is. But I think it's a really important one. I agree. Now let's talk about palliative sedation. Okay. What did you think about how the article presented this option? I thought they did a good job of clearing up some of the myths. Oh, yeah. Like what? Like the idea that it's about ending someone's life. They wow. make it clear that that's not the goal. Okay, good. It's about providing relief mm -hmm. when nothing else is working. Okay, so it's about comfort. Exactly. It's yeah. a last resort. Yeah. When you have things like pain, mm. shortness of breath agitation. And they can't be controlled any other way. Right. Even with strong medication, okay. they define it as giving meds to make the patient less aware. Oh, yeah. So they're not experiencing those symptoms right. as intensely. So they're comfortable. Exactly. And it's always a carefully considered decision. Okay. It's made with the patient, if possible. Yeah. Their family, the healthcare team. So it's a team effort. Exactly. And one thing I thought was interesting is they said that the level of sedation yeah. can be adjusted. Oh, really? Yeah, depending on the patient's needs. Interesting. And sometimes it can even be reversed. Wow. If the patient gets better or if they want to have some time awake. So it's not like a one-way street. Right. It can be 
tailored exactly. to what the patient needs. They have a couple of case studies about this. Oh, yeah. There's one about a man named Jim. Okay. He developed delirium because of liver failure. Yeah. He was really agitated and confused. Oh, that's so sad. And his family was really heartbroken. Of course. They didn't know what to do. Oh, yeah. So the medical team recommended palliative sedation. Okay. As a way to alleviate his suffering. Yeah. And let him die peacefully. I see. And it sounds like it really helped. That's good. Yeah. So these stories are really powerful. They are. Because they show that palliative care isn't about giving up. Right. It's about shifting the focus. Yeah. To comfort and dignity and connection. Exactly. In those final stages. It's about making the best of a difficult situation. Yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. And it really shows that people still have choices, you know, yeah. even when they're facing a serious illness. Absolutely. It em emphasizes that. You know, these conversations about end of life care, they're not just about, you know, medical decisions. Right. They're about deeply personal values and hopes and fears, you know, huh. and it's a chance for people to express their wishes, mm. to say what really matters to them and, you know, to make sure that their loved ones yeah. and their health care providers know what they want right. so they can honor those wishes. Right. And the article also points out that having these conversations is a gift. Yeah. Not just for ourselves, but for our families, too. It really is. It gives them peace of mind yeah. knowing they're doing the right thing, yeah. you know, I even know. if we can't communicate directly anymore. Right. And it takes such a burden off of them. Absolutely. And an already difficult time. Yeah. Well, this has been a really eye-opening deep dive for me. Me, too. And I hope our listeners are finding it valuable as well. I hope so. This article has really made me think about end of life care in a whole new way yeah it's been a really insightful journey for me as well it really has and it's a good reminder that we should be having these conversations Why? with our loved ones while we're still healthy absolutely you know to think about what's important to us yeah and make sure our voices are heard mm -hmm. even when we can't speak for ourselves anymore it's about taking control yeah. of our own stories mm -hmm. even in the face of uncertainty yeah and making sure that our final chapter yeah is lived with dignity and comfort and peace. And it's amazing how much palliative care providers can help yeah. with all of this. Absolutely. You know, they're there to support and guide people yeah. through these really challenging times. They make such a difference. They do. Before we wrap up, yeah. I want to encourage our listeners to check out the resources yes. that we'll have in the show notes. There's so much good information out there. There is. And remember, you don't have to go through this alone. Absolutely. Reach out for help if you need it. Yeah, there are people who can support you. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the end of another deep dive. Uh, okay. We've talked about a lot today. We have. Withholding and withdrawing treatment. Yeah. Decisions about food and fluids. Yeah. And palliative sedation. It's been a great discussion. It really has. And it's been a privilege to share these insights with you. It has been a pleasure. I always learn so much these conversations. Me too. So if you're interested in learning more, yeah. check out the full article. We'll have a link in the show notes. And until next time, keep exploring, keep asking questions. And keep those deep dives going. See you next time. Okay.